How many versions of Jesus Christ are there? You know, I've seen a lot of them. There's the, the regular Sunday school Jesus. I like to call this guy white Republican Jesus. This is the Jesus that teaches kids to be nice, who takes us to heaven when we die, and is kind of fuzzy around the edges. He's a favorite of people who watch Fox News, listen to Rush Limbaugh, but he's not the only Jesus out there. If you've been exposed to a left-leaning Bible college professor, you might have met political revolutionary Jesus. Also known nowadays as woke Jesus. This Jesus is all about the poor and, you know, whatever else the political left is pushing at the moment. There is Buddy Jesus. He's kind of like American Jesus, but this guy never judges anybody. Hey man, love, peace, acceptance. Buddy Jesus isn't sending anybody to hell. Buddy Jesus is taking everybody but Hitler and maybe judgmental people to heaven. There is, as well, a fundamentalist Jesus. He's like American Jesus, except instead of taking everyone to heaven, he sends everyone except KGV-only, separatistic, independent Baptists to hell. There's also Genie Jesus. This is Jesus that, you know, if you say the right kind of prayers or if you just have enough faith, he'll give you whatever you want. Usually money, health, ripe watermelons at the store. There are so many pictures of Jesus out there. But I find when I see movie depictions, there's so little of the actual guy we meet in scripture. The universal truth about all of these, all these pictures of Jesus is that they're actually reflections of the attitudes of the group that likes this guy. You know, Republicans like the Republican version of Jesus. Liberals like the liberal version of Jesus. And in fact, they only pair a, back, a passing resemblance to the Jesus that we meet in the Bible. And so as we start to, to read the Gospel of Luke, I want you to put these cultural ideas out of your mind and meet the Jesus who's far more complex than any one of our simple cultural projections and cultural ideas. The truth is that the real God is totally foreign to us. And so as Jesus is God in the flesh, he's strange to our sensibilities. We need to let scripture teach us who Jesus is rather than friends, TV, professors, culture, or even some Sunday school books. So who is the real Jesus? Point one, there's going to be four points. Jesus was a teacher in the church. How can that be? There wasn't a church. Just stay with me. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. He returned from being tempted. And a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. Now, there is this idea out there that Jesus was not in the church with the saints, but out there with the sinners and tax collectors. This, like so many ideas about Jesus, is partially true. Yes, Jesus subverted all the expectations for a religious leader, and he actually sat down with sinners and ate with them. But he also spent a whole bunch of time going to synagogues, which were the churches of their day. In fact, the, the service of the synagogue has all the same elements of our church service today. They read scripture, they taught on it. Jesus not only went to church, but he's a teacher in the church. Notice in verse 16 here, 
as was his custom, he got up to read. Jesus went to synagogues every Sabbath, participated in worship, and as we're now separated by our current circumstances, we must remember that Christianity was never intended to be a solitary religion. We were meant to meet together and, oh man, do I pray for the day when that can once again be our reality. Luke wants to show us and, and shows right away that Jesus was a teacher. He introduces it before any of the miracles because to Luke, I think Jesus' teaching is more important than than any miracle he could do. Eternal life in the real Jesus comes from the gospel teaching that, that by believing in Jesus Christ, you can be saved from, their, from your sins. Miracles attract crowds, but teaching saves souls. Luke notes that Jesus' teaching ministry was well received at first. It says he was glorified by all. So we see here the real Jesus wasn't just a guy out with the sinners, but he was a teacher in the church of his day. Point two, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Look at verse 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. When our picture of Jesus is shaped by a, a vision of ourselves and our own cultural understanding, you know, Jesus is this, you know, perfectly white Scandinavian guy. We, we miss the really obvious fact that Jesus was of Jewish descent. He probably had pretty dark skin. He was a physical child of Abraham and is the fulfillment of all the promises made to the Old Testament saints. Jesus here reads from Isaiah 61. He picks up the scroll and he turns it purposely to this. And like much of the, the book of Isaiah, God is showing how he's going to restore his people after the fall of the earthly Davidic kingdom. And it talks about this great reversal where good news will come to the poor, liberty will pro be proclaimed to the captives. This chapter also says uh, in verse 8, I will make with them an everlasting covenant. So this chapter is looking forward to the new covenant in Jesus Christ. It also looks forward to the universal scope of Jesus' mission, how he came not just for the nation of Israel, but for the whole world. And that's something that we often really take for granted. Yeah, of course, Jesus, you know, is coming for the whole world. But in this text, this is a really important thing, and we're going to see it in a bit. Verse 11 of Isaiah 61 says, So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. So this great reversal of the poor and the outcast is not only going to come upon Israel, but on the whole world. Now, what are we to make of this language that Jesus says he is the fulfillment of? It, it sounds a little bit like uh, woke Jesus. You know, good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed. The year of the Lord's favor is upon you. Jesus says that he, right there, is filling this 
right before the crowd. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, I, I talked about Jesus as this, uh, some people see him as this political revolutionary. And texts like these are what they draw off of. It's actually called liberation theology. And we really have to wrestle with it. Does this mean that Jesus is coming to release the poor people of their credit card debts, to turn over the world's economic systems? And are, are we bad people for being relatively rich on a worldwide scale? Are we damned for our cars and houses? Well, we do have to take this seriously. And Jesus says lots of things about wealth. You know, you cannot serve two masters. But I think we need to understand these in light of Jesus' whole mission. So I'm going to talk about four things about these particular verses. One, we know that it's not principally talking about literal freedom for literal earthly captives. Although I think that's how the audience might have understood it. Uh, I think they might have heard this and said that, thought, you know, Jesus is about to kick some Roman butt. But Jesus in his life does not bring literal freedom to literal captives. His mission is more in Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free. And this freedom is a political freedom. Free, it's freedom in the most important way, freedom from the power and dominion of sin and death. Jesus dies as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when we read this text and others point it, we see it as showing Jesus' mission on die, to die on the cross for our sins, this is how he gives us spiritual sight. This is good news to the poor. This is freedom from those oppressed by the devil. Because spiritual freedom is the most important kind of freedom. And we can see this uh, too in the, in the example he's going to use of Naaman the Syrian. Uh, you know, Naaman was a commander. He was a man of wealth. But he humbled himself to be dipped in the Jordan River, to be cured of leprosy. You know, this is the type of person that Jesus is talking about when he says that he saves. And, and it's a person he still saves today because everyone is welcome to come to Jesus Christ through the door of faith. But you know what the door of faith? It's a low door. And you need to kind of bow down in humility to walk through. Three, when Jesus says he saves the poor, we have to recognize that it is really the poor who often find Jesus. Uh, Corinthians, uh, Paul says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. And this is still true today. The poor are the ones often who know their need and they come to Jesus. And blessed are the poor that find Jesus. Uh, for uh, when it says Jesus will do all this, you know, Jesus will set every, everyone free in an earthly sense. He will do so when he returns. Jesus did open blind eyes. You know, the church has literally freed people from slavery and does so today. And we should work towards godly ends in all that we do. But all these are mere hints at the complete freedom that Jesus will bring to us at his second coming. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament in that he brings spiritual freedom from bondage to sin to all those who trust in his name. Point three, Jesus, point three, Jesus is the savior of the whole world. We'll go to Luke 4.22 and we're going to break this up a little bit. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Points of the cross, I think. 
what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, to you, said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Jesus was Jewish. He fulfilled the Old Testament. But Jesus wasn't going to be what the people expected. They expected the Messiah to be the conquering king, to come suddenly out of the heavens and to lead the nation of Israel, to throw off the chains of Roman oppression. People are kind of doubtful, like, how can this local kid do this? In fact, it's funny, the people here, they want, it. They want Jesus to give in to the temptation of Satan that we just saw. The people want Jesus to take control of the world. They want him to take the devil's deal and lead the world for Israel. They want him to prove his messiahship by doing great signs, just like Jesus tempts Satan to do by being caught by the angels. The people here are really speaking to Jesus with the, with the voice of Satan. And it's, it's right after they speak well of Jesus. And it, and it goes to show like how fickle the crowd is. I, you know, truth does not get many likes on Facebook. Jesus goes on from here and, and shows, uh, contrary to what the, the crowd wants, what his mission is really going to be like. Verse 25. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. What we need to see here is both of these examples are of these Jewish prophets helping not their fellow countrymen. Even in this time of great distress, there was a famine. But instead, they went and they helped foreigners. Jesus presents this crowd with a simple but startling truth. God's plan is not to exalt ethnic Israel alone, but instead to save the whole world. This is foreshadowing something that is uh, going to come to fruition at the end of Luke's writing. You know, Luke wrote Luke and Acts. At the end of Acts 28, it says this. Paul says this after being rejected at the synagogue. Therefore, let it be known to you, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, they will listen. When we ourselves listen to this and see the scope of Jesus' mission, we should be challenged as well that we can't just be satisfied to reach people with the message of Christ, the hope of Christ, that, that look kind of like us and are around us, but we, like Christ, have a mission to the whole world. Well, point four. Jesus, the real Jesus, was not universally loved. Verse 28. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him over the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. The false pictures of Jesus that are often put forward by our culture and so many are, I think, lacking most of all in that they are too safe. They're non-offensive. Now, the real Jesus made the crowd so upset that they, in a frenzy, you know, picked him up in a mob and brought him to the edge of a cliff to cast him down into the rocks. But then he just kind of walks through the middle of them and goes this way. I have no idea how this, how, how Luke is picturing this for, for my mind, but God protected him from harm. Interestingly enough, last week, Jesus was unwilling to throw himself off a cliff to provoke a miracle of God. 
Now the, tr the mob tries to throw Jesus off a cliff, but by a miracle is prevented from doing so. You know, Jesus is going to die, but he is protected from God every day till he gets there. Now, why were they this, they this mad? They, they loved him just a moment ago, and now they're attempting to murder him. This is Palm Sunday. And the contrast between the welcoming crowds shouting Hosanna and the mob crying out, Crucify, is stark in the same way. Like that future mob, this crowd goes from slightly questioning Jesus as a local kid to wanting him dead and dead right now. Why this radical change in the crowd? And I think it's kind of like uh, if you know someone who's fallen in love too quickly and they fall in love with this person like everything's perfect about this person then three weeks later they're like ah oh, they're the worst person in the entire world and the reason why they had this change of, of mind about them is that the person they thought they fell in love with was just a figment of their imagination it, it, they didn't they didn't really understand them the person didn't change just their perception changes the crowds in the synagogue have the same kind of thing. They love their idea of Jesus. They love the Messiah as the political liberator. They love the idea of Jesus they had in their head, but they didn't actually love the real Jesus that was there. They didn't love the Jesus that cared not only for the outcast of Israel, but for those of the whole world. They love the idea of the Jesus that was gonna give them what they wanted. But when that Jesus turned out to be a figment of their collective imaginations, they turned on him quicker than, a, than, a, than we might with a stranger with a cough. In summary, who is the real Jesus? We can see that Jesus was a teacher in the church. That Jesus was not just a um, white American, but he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus isn't just a savior of a, of a people, but he's the savior of the whole world. And finally, Jesus is not universally loved. I want to close today with a, a bit of a weird plea for a preacher. And that is that you have your walk away from Jesus moment. Now, now don't, don't walk away from, from the real Jesus. But if you have some sort of safe Jesus-like substitute that isn't really like the guy that we're reading about, you know, stop believing in him. We need to believe in the real Jesus. The Jesus who was a teacher in the church, who stood up to read scripture in the synagogue, we need to believe the, the Jesus who was Jewish, who was the fulfillment of the Jewish Old Testament. At the same time, we need to believe in the Jesus who was the savior of the whole world and not buy into this myth of the popular buddy Jesus that everybody loves. Jesus' mission was to come and confront a sinful people of their sin. That's why they get so mad at him, because he points out their, their blatant nationalism. And pointing out sin is something that often does not win you friends. Jesus preached a hard message to those who are blind to their sin, but he also preached saving grace to sinners, for every kind of sinner who's humble enough to bow their head to come to him.